we are uh, very pleased uh, to have uh, Dr. Nathan Ross, uh, which is uh, the vice president of the CCL Berlin uh, in King's Prussia, and he is uh, United States, and, and he is responsible uh, for uh, the development of uh, different products. Uh, those products are those ones that uh, Clifford Lane, uh, in his uh, presentation, uh, he was uh, he was pointing like uh, priorities uh, in the guidelines of, of the Department of uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases that, uh, that he is the director. Uh, uh, just uh, in, in the area of immunomodulation, uh, those uh, products that are an, an antibody derived, such as uh, antisera for convalescent uh, plasma and uh, uh, hyperimmune immunoglobulins, uh, in addition to the monoclonal antibodies, uh, CSL bearing uh, is in the forefront of the development of, 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 of those products. And uh, we are very proud uh, to have here uh, uh, Nathan Rowe uh, just uh, to, to hear what, uh, what he has to, to tell us about this, uh, this um, uh, innovation in therapy. In the lower part of the screen where it says record, share screen, can you see that? The chat box, participants. So all the way to the right, you want to put that in English. It's disappeared. Okay, let's look for it. <laughs> Let me see what the technicians.
You got it? Okay. Yep, I've got it. Is it English now? It's in English now, yes. Wonderful, thank you. So if you're able to go to the presentation. Yeah, it's coming up. There Great. You go. Thank you very much. I, I apologize for that. Um, no worries. Uh, so again, I'd, I do would like to thank the um, the organizers for um, putting on such a broad and and um, well balanced program. It's I, I think I've learned a lot today, and uh, um, I'm really enjoying the program. And uh, now I don't have control of the the slides. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. There's no. There we go. Yes, thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, so my agenda today, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of introduction about CSL, but primarily spend the time focusing on the uh, efforts of the COVID-19 Plasma Alliance in the production of a polyclonal hyperimmune against um, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, CSL is, is really interestingly positioned during the COVID-19 pandemic to uh, contribute to efforts both um, in the development of treatments against and vaccines in the prevention of uh, COVID-19. CSL has two main businesses. One is a plasma-based biotherapeutic company with both plasma protein and recombinant platform technologies, as well as our Securus um, vaccine division, which uh, has the ability for cell-based technologies as well as adjuvants available. And um, we have a very global presence um, with a extensive plasma collection network, uh, with a, also with a very broad and um, varied manufacturing capability. And with a large investment in R&D, this really has allowed us to understand and position ourselves um, to provide a very focused COVID-19 response. And our efforts have gone across from prevention through to treatment of um, moderately severe through to severe um, patients uh, in, in trying to find therapies that may be applicable here. So within the prevention, uh, we are um, participating in the vaccine development with the University of Queensland and CEPI, as well as we've made our adjuvant technology available to a broad variety of vaccine manufacturers. We have scaled manufacturing, which is, uh, will be utilized uh, as a C uh, contract manufacturing organization for some of the leading vaccines out there. And then um, within the treatment space, we are uh, looking at developing polyclonal hyperimmunes. Uh, Cliff, Dr. Cliff Lane had mentioned this earlier on. There's our efforts within the Plasma Alliance, which I'll speak about today, but we've also developing a, poly, um, developing a hyperimmune for the government of Australia, as well as a, uh, assisting in a collaboration with SAB Therapeutics which has a humanized uh, polyclonal um, hyperimmune uh, derived from cows. And finally, we have um, uh, an anti monoclonal antibody, CSL312, which is in the clinics. It's an anti-factor 12A, which is used in the prevention of, um, hopefully will be used in the prevention of, of inflammatory mediation, mediators that could lead to vascular disease. So the COVID-19 Plasma Alliance was uh, really put together as an unprecedented partnership of world leading plasma companies uh, formed to meet this unprecedented challenge of COVID-19. And uh, now there's greater than 12 global and regional uh, plasma companies, all of us with the deep experience in discovering, developing and producing plasma derived therapies and all of us with uh, rather broad and um, plasma collection um, capabilities. 
And <clears throat> being able to, uh, working together, uh, our goal is to develop a non-branded hyperimmune globulin that contains consistently high levels of IgG antibodies to the new coronavirus. Uh, this is one of several options needed, and you've heard of different potential options uh, today that are available in the treatment um, for COVID-19. And the goal of the Alliance was to accelerate the development of this potential medicine, uh, which would overall improve our chances of success and increase the supply and availability of to potential medicines worldwide, if approved. Um, by bringing uh, the smartest minds from our, our very companies together uh, and leveraging our collective ex expertise, we believe that we would be able to bring uh, products um, into the clinical trials uh, much quicker. The Alliance was founded by CSL Bering and Takeda. And within it, there were another, I think it's now another nine or, or 10 um, member and contributor companies uh, representing various worldwide plasma fractionators. And then also significant was our supporters who are in various ways contributing towards the Alliance cause. So we call this non-branded hyperimmune COVID-19. It's an acronym for coronavirus immunoglobulin. And it is a hyperimmune globulin, which um, differs from convalescent plasma in that it contains purified IgG. So it uh, does not have, it has only very, very low levels of IgA and IgM in it. And by uh, putting it through a manufacturing process um, we're able to remove or inactivate any potential viruses and provide a standardized and consistent level of virus-specific antibodies in each unit. So if you take a step back and, and you think about where plasma-derived therapies come from, uh, plasma is the straw-colored liquid in blood and it constitutes about 55% of the total volume uh, in a blood donation. And within the plasma, about 7% is, pr uh, is plasma proteins, 92% is water. And of that 7% of proteins, about 15% of that are immunoglobulins. So what the Alliance set out to do was leverage our existing capabilities to rapidly develop a potential therapy. Using our extensive uh, established plasma collection centers, uh, we use these to further set up COVID-19 convalescent uh, plasma programs um, across the Alliance. Uh, one of the key challenges early on, of course, was establishing new analytical, analytical methods suitable for measuring anti-SARS-CoV-2. And this was needed for one, for identifying the appropriate convalescent plasma donors, and then two, for actually measuring the potency um, of IgG in the final container. And with that, uh, because we have, uh, several of us have uh, BSL-3 laboratories, uh, we were able to quickly set up live virus anti-SARS-CoV-2 potency assays to support our, um, our efforts as well as the necessary um, binding assays as well. Uh, <clears throat> then we utilized our, our um, existing manufacturing processes. So um, we already have uh, immunoglobulin processes available to us at various scales. And we use these established processes with well-known safety profiles associated with the products that come out of those to actually man, uh, to manufacture our clinical batches. batches. And of course, as I mentioned, these manufacturing processes also contain validated virus reduction steps in, within them. Our batch release assures safety, quality, potency, and testing. And now um, with that, we have, were able to produce clinical batches um, that are now ready to enter into clinical trials where we will be able to evaluate uh, safety and efficacy in those in uh, randomized controlled trials. After that, we'll be uh, regulatory approval of one form or the other, and then um, uh, commercial scale availability. So in terms of plasma collection, 
this was probably the, the uh, most challenging uh, aspect uh, to get the program up and running to begin with. However, because we have an extensive network across the entire alliance, uh, more than half of all potential donors in the US actually live within a 15 mile radius of a collection center. Um, once we had our convalescent plasma programs up and running, we were able to rapidly upscale uh, plasma collection and uh, en enough to meet the needs of our clinical trial and now commercial trial demands. Nonetheless, the COVID-19 pandemic has actually um, uh, decreased uh, the, uh, plasma collection uh, worldwide. And uh, it's really important uh, for the manufacture of other, or other biotherapeutics and for the patients that rely on them that we continue to urge all healthy adults, whether or not they've recovered from COVID-19, to continue to get out and, and donate plasma. Their, um, your, your plasma donations make a difference to those people who rely on the serious, uh, who have serious and rare diseases that rely on these treatments. And you can see just how many um, donations are actually required to produce plasma-derived therapies. So for an immunoglobulin uh, primary immunodeficient patient, uh, essentially 130 donations are required to treat one patient for a year. So as I had mentioned, plasma donation was one of the uh, most important things. And, and um, there was a presentation by Abbott earlier on, which indicated a variety of um, aspects that one needs to consider when, when looking at what type of test to use. In our case, we're looking at screening large volumes of donations. And we want to do this in a, in a highly automated and uh, high throughput fashion. And as we had the Abbott um, Architect um, hardware already in, uh, established within our testing centers, uh, we initially uh, immediately went and evaluated the Abbott Architect um, testing platform, which looks at the uh, nucleoprotein and uh, looked at this of, of whether this would be suitable for identifying donations, uh, donors um, and donations that, that could enter into our plasma manufacturing pools. And you could see here, when you correlate this against uh, various other epitopes of SARS-CoV-2, that there is some decent correlations. Of course, it's not perfect, but because we're looking for a rapid response and a response that's reliable, uh, we decided to move forward with the Abbott um, test. And you can see we've now followed uh, certain donors. Donors can give um, every um, approximately every uh, two times a week. Um, and we've now followed um, multiple donors. This graph here actually represents uh, 30 um, longitudinal donors over the time. And you can see that there is a fall off um, in um, anti-SARS-CoV antibody over a five month period approximately. And, and uh, this is consistent with what other people have reported within the literature. Um, the data here shows the Abbott results, but you can also see this with the Euromune, which targets the S binding and as well as different um, uh, ELISA tests that we have as well. It's a pretty consistent picture here that once a donor has contracted uh, or recovered from um, COVID-19, you have between three and five months approximately of collecting their plasma before the titers um, drop off. And uh, these results here show the um, results of the first four clinical batches that CSL has produced. We measure our potency in terms of alliance units. We developed a standard based off a convalescent uh, plasma unit, and then further developed a secondary immunoglobulin standard uh, that's referenced against this initial standard. To give you an idea of what a typical convalescent plasma unit looks like, a median unit, is somewhere between 150 and 300 alliance units per mil. And our final containers uh, average about 1,100 alliance units per mil. Uh, it should be noticed that uh, plasma has contribution, uh, pot neutralization contribution that comes from IgA and IgM, as well as the IgG subclasses. Whereas uh, the hyperimmune is 100% essentially um, potency related to IgG. 
So where are we now? We're at the stage of uh, about to begin the clinical trial. This clinical trial is being conducted by the um, NIAID or NIH. And uh, as Dr. Cliff Lane had uh, indicated earlier in, 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 the, in his talk, and um, the study will be conducted uh, within the United States, Europe, Japan, and rest of the world. Um, and it should be uh, starting within the next uh, week or two weeks. And as Dr. Cliff Lane had mentioned that hyperimmune therapies have previously been shown to be effective in treating severe uh, viral respiratory infections. And we hope that it also will ha have the potential to treat people who are at risk for serious complications from COVID-19. This is the uh, protocol, in, um, uh, the clinical design uh, for INSIGHT 013. There's actually um, 500 patients that will be enrolled in randomized one-to-one -one against the standard of care. The standard of care includes remdesivir, and these will be followed um, out over a 28-day period with the primary endpoint at day seven. Uh, what's very interesting in this whole um, clinical trial is that there's actually four different manufacturers present, um, participating in the clinical trial, each of them with their own uh, polyclonal hyperimmune. Um, what this means is that uh, we, we do all agree that there's a single um, quality, um, critical quality attribute, which is the potency. Uh, anti-SARS-CoV-2 potency, but all of us also have different uh, really drug products with different excipients um, in them. Um, all of, uh, though these four products will be used and, and randomized against those 500 um, patients. And um, the results of that, of the trial will be pooled and shared amongst the four manufacturers uh, in order to um, look at, um, evaluate efficacy and, and, and safety of the products. And of course, safety will be looked at also between uh, the products themselves. If the data is um, supportive of, of efficacy, um, then this data will be used by additional manufacturers within the Alliance to leverage against in order to obtain additional um, registrations or emergency youth authorization in order for them to produce product and utilize it um, within their regions or, or, or um, um, within um, certain countries. So the path ahead uh, really requires, uh, based upon the outcomes of the clinical trials, uh, we will be submitting our um, results or dossiers to the EMA and uh, FDA, as well as other uh, potential countries, national health authorities um, to seek approval. And, um, and then the uh, unbranded product will be distributed by a third party um, to assure equitable uh, distribution and wide access to the product. We have now begun commercial manufacturing across the Alliance. Um, there are four manufacturers currently identified for commercial batch production two based within the US and two based within um, Europe. And uh, I look forward to uh, hopefully hearing positive results out of this from Cliff, Dr. Lane and, and the NIH. And um, with that, I finish my presentation and thank you. Hello? Yeah. Adolfo? Yeah, Eduardo. Uh, 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 do you think that uh, we can take some questions or just wait for the discussion with the session of vaccine? Well, I think it's, it's up to uh, the whole organizers, right? Uh, we are running a little bit late, um, so... Okay, so we... let's, let's, let's have the discussion all together. Uh, in the session of the yeah. vaccine, that is going to be uh, 15 minutes. Okay, and Dr. Roth, you will be still available during the next session? Oh, I yes, will. Dr. Roth. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for your yes. presentation. You will be available.
Okay, yes. you bet. Do better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I think it's my turn, but uh, I have to be introduced by the chair. That is uh, Dr. Luis Sanjuanes. Where is he? Uh, 